I'm, I'm wondering, what are you up to these days and what are you working on? You know, at the piano, what are you, are you figuring out right now? Well, let's see. That's a question with a lot of different answers to it. It branches off in a number of different ways. Right now, I'm thinking a lot about chords, actually. Yeah. Even, um, I'm trying things with, I guess you would call them block chords, but they don't follow, they, I'm not moving them according to like any prescribed notion of how it's supposed to move. I'm just moving sounds around with melodic shapes on the top of them. So like getting into those types of things at times and even beyond that, just really making space in my solos, really taking moments to comp for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In between I heard you what do I'm that. playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know what you so mean. So I'm trying to develop that further. And I mean, there's so, so many musicians who do really great things with that. Uh, I always keep on coming back to Gonzalo. Yeah. He creates these, la these landscapes of like chords and harmony. And then with these lines that emerge from it, like the flashes of lightning or you yeah. know, something else that's emerging into this sky. Yeah, that, that, those are some of the things that are on my mind at the piano. In addition to that, I'm also spending a bit more time playing some keyboards these days. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on creating and refining sounds that feel inspiring for me to play, like mm -hmm. lead sounds and uh, pads and different types of things that blend with acoustic piano in a way that doesn't jarringly put it inside like, oh, well, now that feels very synthy. I'm, I'm always looking yeah. for stuff which feels sort of warm and feels like it could be at home in a mostly acoustic kind of setting. Yeah. Who, who are your role models or guys that inspired you for this type of thing? I mean, well, there's so many. Uh, for, for synth sounds, I mean, Boards of Canada, it's an amazing electronic, electronic band from, uh, they're still working now, but there's a record called Music Has the Right to Children. Mm -hmm. The sounds on that record are uh, really quite astonishing. I think they're just very rich and textured. I mean, Aphex Twin as well. I mean, Joe Zawinul as far as mm -hmm. like keyboard players and uh, understanding what that instrument can do as an improviser. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Jason Lindner is doing really cool things with keyboards these days, mm. as is uh, James Francis, young mm -hmm. piano player who's yeah. coming up now. He's finding his own thing with it. Pete Rendy. Sure. I don't know if you yeah. know. He's a great guy and he's a he's a guru for sonic kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But also for piano playing, he, he's play, piano playing. Oh, lovely, man. Right? Oh, it's very, very, very good. And he writes beautiful tunes. Yeah, and, I, I would yeah, I'd love to great. hear more from him actually these days. It's hard to. Uh, we, yeah, I, we all would. I want we a record. I want a record. Pete Randy record. That's a long that's a. That's a long story right there. <laughs> mm, I guess. Okay. But there's some yeah. great stuff to find on, on SoundCloud. And there sure is. There was a lot of great stuff on MySpace, and I still think about that stuff. Do you remember that uh, acoustic guitar version of a song in Esperanto by Thomas Morgan on MySpace? Oh, yeah. Yep. Where's that? I want to hear this, you know, because I have... I uh, want to hear that, too. Yeah. Um, why, why, just, that... Was it just a random thing that he just just played some acoustic I mean, but it sounds he, very intricate and very interesting it's very intricate he, and he's done a number of shows singing and playing wow uh, okay here and there i'd like to know more as well mm. he always has that way of putting things exactly i don't even know how to say it it's like he puts them exactly where they are <laughs> they're exactly where they are you know it's not even that they're exactly where they should be They are where they feel inevitable, but also very surprising. Yeah. You know, yeah. the way that he plays. Mm -hmm. I always think of it, it's like Charlie Hayden through a prism or a computer hacker's mind or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it's, it's also just Thomas, so. Very unique, very unique. I love that trio recording that you released for, for free on Bandcamp. Oh, yeah. Thanks, yeah. man. That was a fun band. That's a beautiful combination also with RJ and, and, and Thomas. Yep. It sounds really great together. As does yeah, the, new, it, the, the other trio recording of yours. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, those are very different ideas in how the trios came together. Because uh, RJ and Thomas, they have such a different idea even. Like from even from one another, like just where they feel the beat there's this rub between them. It's like not, it's not comfortable. 
Mm -hmm. It's like there's this push pull between the two of them, which created this this friction. And I and then eventually, by the time we got to the end of the tour, I, I loved that feeling, and I loved being in that zone where they were like almost agreeing, but there was that rub. Was it something know? that you guys talked about, or was it not addressed? Not. A, not Not, not. We we didn't talk too much about it. There were moments where we were feeling like where where it was sort of obvious that people were just like kind of on different pages, and mm. I kind of wanted to just let it play out. Though I I I for me at least I was like, let's just keep going, yeah, and see what happens, um, without forcing things into any particular way. Yeah. And I guess in a, in a certain way it was similar with the with the trio with Ben and Billy I guess you might say but in a similar but different because the bass and drums their thing together is very clear for each other like they play together in a way that both of them really love and they just yeah. they've got years playing together and they just have a really magical hookup together yeah um True. But that that being said, it's not the kind of hookup which is going to make things simple or clear for you. If you're sort of looking for uh, bass and drums to hold down the center and then like the piano just runs around and does whatever it wants on top of it, yeah. that's not what you're going to get. What, yeah. what that band feels like to me is um, the center is empty, actually. Mm-hmm. The center is empty and we're all like there in the whirlpool hanging around right around the center, always like related to it, but very rarely like, yeah, like, here it is, which is a disorienting. But also once you like step into that responsibility of the fact that you're like, oh, I'm not at all sitting on top of this. Like I'm one part of creating this thing. Like. Once you step into that, it feels very empowering. It, yeah, it's just exciting. And it's like, I don't know what's going to happen at yeah. all. Yeah, they treat the beat in a, such a loose and yet very direct way. Yep. And I was wondering where you think of yourself, like where do you place yourself? Where where, where would you go for for which kind of beat would you decide in a way? <laughs> you know, Because sometimes, you know, the maybe the untrained listener would say they're not yeah. together you know right. like in the first moment like wh what are they doing well, there but especially a... like the very the first moment of the first track of the record in particular mm. i mean the very first track of that record i'm not sure that we are together <laughs> like i mean like not even the untrained the trained listener i'm like yeah. but one of the things that i actually really love about that there's there is something of that first track and that particular take of it where it all feels a little bit like we're kind of just all on our own trip mm. at the same time. Yeah. And over the course of the record, one of the things that sort of was strange and also kind of brilliant about the way that Manfred sequenced it is that it tells a story of, of like three becoming one mm -hmm. over the course of the record. The way, by the time you get to the last two tunes, It, the trio feels like a one living, breathing thing. Mm. At the, the very first moments of track one, it feels like the whole enterprise might just be shaky and might we might fall apart in the first few measures, mm. you know? Um, but that being said, to your, um, wider, que to your like, wider question, um, there were times when I would think about laying back or trying to be on the front of the beat, like, I couldn't think in those terms. Yeah, right. I couldn't think I couldn't think about it like that. When I tried to do that, I mean, we played six gigs or so before doing the record. And some of them were really fun and some of them were definitely like I was trying things and it just wasn't working. You know? Uh, uh, just what I, what I felt like I needed to do was to really go within myself and deeply trust myself. Yeah. And be like, where do I feel it? Not where am I going to put it? What am I going to do? I'm just like, where do I feel it? The biggest thing was just leaving even more space than I thought that I should. Mm. And also just because there's so much going on with the two of them. And I didn't want it to be like a trio record with, okay, the piano and then bass and drums are like, 
oh, they're just, you know, holding me up. I, I, I loved that slippery, but somehow muscular kind of like fluid thing when the bass and the drums, you're like, oh, they're kind of, that's like the main thing also, you know, mm -hmm. all three is the main thing. Yeah. I think it's also apparent then in your, in your listening, like you're not listening to one person per se or the other person mm -hmm. in order to find your yep. space in terms of time, but also what kind of texture to play. You're, you're listening to the whole picture and then yep. that gives you the answer for where to put yourself. Right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to a large extent. Yeah. And then listening to that gives me an answer. And then other times just being like, well, I'm going to be doing this and I trust you're going to be doing this and you're going to be doing this. And we all kind of trust ourselves enough or, or not even, it's just, let's see how it sounds. If we are all doing our thing yeah. together, that is sometimes very scary. Mm. You know, especially for someone like me, I tend to write music that has very specific things in mind a lot of the time. But I feel like, you know, do, do, you, do you write for specific projects, more or less? You just write and then you see what kind of uh, environment you put that song into or how, how do you... That's, a, that's, that's mostly correct. Yeah. Mostly I just write and then I'm like, okay, yeah, this, this feels like this makes sense in this world. Um, like I'm not gonna take a part. I'm not gonna take a tune that has a very specific integral drum part to the tune. I'm not gonna take that to a group with Billy Hart and tell him to. No. You. I'm. No, I'm just. Just not what's gonna happen. Right. <laughs> no. You know. Play themselves. And the way. They, well, they'll play themselves, and Billy will find his approach over time. Yeah. You know. How's your relationship with Ben Street? Can you tell me a little bit more about working with him and what you? Uh, learn from him or uh, you know what what the relationship is because you seem to have a very uh, specific thing together you guys it really sounds very together in a way and very um, intimate and uh, unique Ben Ben is uh, I mean he's one of my best friends you know and at times he's one of my best fiends <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know mm -hmm. um I went through like a period of time, I'd say from 2008 to sometime in like 2014 or 2013, maybe, where he was living in Red Hook and I live in a neighborhood called Cobble Hill. So neighborhoods that aren't too far away from each other. Mm. And we just used to hang out all the time, especially having very late night hangs, starting at like 10, having a bunch of people over, listening to a ton of music and drinking a ton of natural wine. We would listen to stuff. He would quest you like he was sort of the ringleader. Mm. He's a really brilliant and larger than life kind of personality. Mm -hmm. uh, he would sometimes like question us on our taste and what we're like. And he would show us stuff that he was listening to. I, I learned so much from spending time listening to records with him. Yeah, like what? Can um, you can you go into detail? Oh man, I mean, there's actually many that are coming to mind. I remember him showing us the Mary Lou Williams with Buster Williams. Oh. Uh, Free Spirits. I don't know that one. It's a record. Yeah, talk about time and talk about like together while also doing their own thing. Yeah. Uh, Baby Man. I think mm. it's like track two on that record it is just unbelievable. I remember him showing me that and that being a real revelation. I'm thinking about one time in particular, we were listening to, I think it was something from Belonging, the Keith mm -hmm. Jarrett record, but we listened to it on CD as a MP3 on vinyl. We listened to it in all these different formats, just one after the next and just compared how it made us feel. Yeah. And it was, yeah, that, and it, that was really crazy, actually. Mm. Just the difference between how some of the formats sounded like, okay, well, here's all of the information. Like, yeah. this is all of the information of the notes that Keith is playing. And then other formats were like, oh, my God, this sounds like music. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That makes sense. Um, it was very, very interesting. Um spent a lot of time listening to a lot of very, very different stuff. I mean, some of the late Coltrane with Alice on piano. Mm. And then a lot of time spent listening to Alice in general. Oh, yeah. There's the live one, Transfiguration. I don't know that one. Uh, 
Oh, it's so good. Oh, yeah? With Roy Haynes. Roy Haynes is on drums and Reggie Workman on bass. And oh, she's great. on organ. Wow. Yeah. I'll check that out. It's pretty serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd get into like just giant arguments about important things or unimportant things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he was like an older brother, you know? Mm -hmm. He is like that. He's like an older brother who's sort of questioning me about what was important to me in music mm -hmm. and why. Yeah. And made me think about those some of those questions a little bit more deeply for myself. Mm -hmm. And I just love the way that he plays as well. Yeah. How does it the, the uh, hanging out and the, the listening to music together and asking you all these questions and then posing those questions onto yourself, how does that translate then into you playing together, you guys? Is that a different dynamic well, then, or is it... Uh, it's, a di it's a different dynamic then. I suppose It's a different so. dynamic. Ben requires a certain precision of language. Mm -hmm. He sort of demands that. And it's not demanding, but like, if you're just saying stuff and you're not really sure why you're saying it or what you're saying, I've noticed that he can be like, okay, I see what's happening, and then not really that engaged. Mm -hmm. And I can notice that happening on the bandstand If you mean what you say and you speak in a way that allows people to digest what you've said, mm -hmm. you know, then he's right there. Yeah. And he's totally and he's totally engaged. And if not, then, you know, then he'll just be playing with Billy, you know, mm -hmm. and then I'll be like, okay, well, I'm playing and I'm trying to play, you know, so, but that's <laughs> that's okay. I'm not trying to hire people because they're like, oh, they're going to give me attention or they're going to. Yeah, hold you know, your hand. Try to make time. me hold my hand, make me feel good. I'm like, yeah. I love the way you play, and I want to try to figure out how to be able to play with that. You know, mm -hmm. but I think that 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 friendship definitely does show up as well yeah. in the music, in terms of just having spent so much time as a human being in your life with this person, you can't help but have certain things a little bit more in sync and just sure. feeling together. You know, mm -hmm. it just shows up like that. I don't know what exactly was the first time I heard you play. It might have been a bootleg of, I, I was following a lot of uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel's stuff that he was playing and then was, oh, he's playing with a new piano player. Who's this guy? Or yeah. it might have been the Gretchen Palato record, the, um, All right. the one with Lionel, the, the first inofficial release, or right. with Terence Blanchard. I'm not sure right now, but those right. sort of overlap in my remembrance. And I was really amazed by what you played and, I had this feeling, I, I'm sure you had this feeling too, hearing somebody introduce something uh, who's, who's not much older than you, but a little older than you, introduce something to the tradition in a way. You, in a way, you introduced a new way of playing. What mainly comes to my mind is a new way of playing lines in our music. Mm. You know, I think you introduced mm. a new way to the tradition and it has become a part of the tradition. And my feeling mm. was, wow, that's possible. That's, you know, right. wow, that's possible. That's good to hear that this is possible, that you can actually do this, you know. Uh, totally. That I, one that's, can that's, do this, you know. That's crazy. Yeah, I hadn't really ever thought of it in, that ter in those terms, but I do know that feeling. I remember that with uh, David Vareas when right. he came to town. Yeah. And then... And, and, And I was like, oh, it, and it's like, it, it's introducing something new, which has also, you know, it's something new, which is also something which is hidden in plain sight. Sure. Yeah. Somehow it's there's true. that feeling as well. It's like, it's, I mean, and that's the thing about newness, you know, I don't even know. It's just, we're arranging things in a, perhaps we're combining things or arranging them in a slightly different way. Right. I, I think most people that you talk to, at least, yeah, in my opinion, I've, I knew, I don't know. I don't know what that means. I know exactly. what you mean. I, I know what you're referring to. You know, it's usually it's different old things or established things yeah. put together in a new way and then they look different and become something new. Exactly. You know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. But I think that's yeah. what you did. And uh, I was wondering if there was a stage in your life where you went like, I'm Aaron Parks, realizing that you're that guy that people now are copying or uh, people are following, which can make one feel like, oh, now I have to live up to what their view of me is. You know what I mean? Oh, 
I mean, I I think that I definitely went through that as a, at a, at a younger age in particular. Like, oh, so I I you know I'm hearing musicians who are copying th- you know sometimes copying things that I did, and I'm and I'm like, oh, but I didn't not that part. Like yeah. that's not the part that I meant. Like take yeah. the good part. Yeah, yeah. You know, sure. like that. You know. Yeah. Uh, like Paul Blay says as well, he's like, you know, by all means, you know, imitation is a, is the greatest form of flattery, of course, but take the best and omit the rest, Yeah, you know? Yeah. But then within myself, I think that there were definitely moments that I was like, oh, I guess, you know, everybody says I'm the guy. Mm. I'm supposed to be the guy? Like, what? I don't know, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just figuring this out. I'm a 25-year-old person at that time. Yeah, feeling like I was supposed to know more about life or music or something when the fact was is that I knew that I had giant gaps in my education mm-hmm. in both. Like I had maybe brought certain, I'd rearranged things slightly different and I'd brought uh, my own approach to this music. Um, but there were still massive holes in my development that I was like really still feeling like I needed to work on. I'm, and I'm still working on them. But I mean, that's part of the reason why over the last decade or so, I haven't been doing as many things as a leader because Mm -hmm. I've been really trying to work much more on those things that weren't quite as together Mm -hmm. for me back then, it didn't feel like. Hmm. So it's interesting. I remember hearing a number of young musicians a while ago and some of them, you know, who, who have gone on and they're doing great things in this music but who when they were first coming up and i was like this is very strange they sound like me and yeah. that's a and then it, then having that realization like oh wait me like that's a thing that somebody can sound like yeah you know that there is a me that somebody can sound like yeah sure yeah um, right <laughs> yeah and i'm like oh that's weird mhm i um, think i've gone through moments of my development where I'm like very obsessively focused on one thing. But in general, for me, I'm just like always trying to approach the same thing from a different angle. Yeah. And I'm still always feeling like, well, I'm not there yet. I ha- I'm, I, know, sure. I know when I hear it and I know when I hear it and when, it, when I feel it and I'm like, well, that's what I mean to be doing. And then I also know when I hear things in other musicians who inspire me and I want to incorporate some aspect of that, or just like become familiar with it so that I understand that possibility. Um, yeah. You know, I mentioned David Vareas. When he first came to town, his approach was so radically different yeah. from most of the other musicians around here, but it was very, very compelling. Yeah. It was one of those things that forced everyone to kind of take stock. Yeah. At least for me. Yeah. I was like, okay, that's a very clear and powerful approach. And it's not particularly linearly based. Yeah. You know, but it's definitely telling a story. I just wanted to understand that. So I, I hung out with him a bunch. And also, you know, I took a lesson from him. And uh, mm. not in the sense of like, hey, I want to take your thing. Mm. But just in the sense of like, where, like, where is some of this coming from? And yeah. Then, you know, that opened me up to a lot of other ideas. And some of the stuff that really kind of blew my mind about his approach to harmony was how how much of it, at least what he was showing me, so many of his approaches to voicings come from like Barry Harris sometimes I- yeah. ideas that he had subverted. Yeah. You know? That makes sense, yeah. And as I'm getting, you know, as I'm getting older as well and also feeling more, like I'm getting closer and closer to just being like, well, I'm going to keep on growing and I'm going to keep on trying to like bring more things into my, into how I play music. But I play the way that I play. Yeah. In general. And that's okay. I play the way that I play. And that's good. Like, I don't need to try to be anybody but myself. Yeah. You know? That's true. Um, I do, you know, and I'd want to address the things that still feel like they're missing for me in terms of what I'm looking for. Um, I still, I still have a lot of work to do with my left hand. Mm. Um, Same here. And yeah, (laughs) but I feel more just like, here I am, this is me. And I'm going to try to show up and try to make music that sounds good to me yeah. but there's so many great mu- young musicians coming to town mm. um i mean the the one who's been freaking me out most recently uh is a young guy named micah thomas 
Yeah, I heard him play. Yeah, he's great. He sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Micah is on his. He's really on his way, and he's and the thing that I appreciate about him as well is, I mean, he's got a ton of facility and a ton of imagination, of course. Yeah. But he's also got just a sense of space and a sense of humor. Yeah. And there's just like a lightness and an, and an absurdity yeah. to his thing. Um, yeah, it's true. Which I I love that you know Sullivan Fortner has that oh, to yeah. a certain extent as well you know. Um, I he's went a monster. To, I went to go hear. Oh yeah, he's amazing, man. I went to hear him at Mesro last night. Oh, what 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 stuff did you learn from Sullivan? Oh, let's see. Either through um, hanging or or you know watching him play, hearing him play. With watching Sullivan play, the thing that I The thing that I really appreciate is a welcoming casualness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just even how how he'll introduce how, a band or say good night. How he'll introduce the band. <laughs> how he is, just how he is at the piano, looking off into the distance, like yeah. almost Errol Garner esque. Yeah. Yeah. Playing a ton of stuff, and like I don't know whether he's chewing a toothpick or gum or what he's got in his mouth, but he's always chewing something. Yeah. Um, I couldn't do that. He... I once almost choked on <laughs> on a chewing gum because I was oh, I was very young. I was like maybe fifteen, and I was playing with the big band. And my my only solo of that night came on. You know, came about and was oh, like, yeah. <gasps> you know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I no. don't know why I thought I should <laughs> I should uh, you know have a chewing gum in my mouth, but I almost choked about of it. You know, I was like. <laughs> And then I had to play, uh, you know. So I'm I'm not doing that anymore. And if, every time I see somebody, I'm like, watch it, man. Don't get excited. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I mean, it seems like he's got his thing figured out as far as that goes. Yeah. But, uh, I, I always, when I see him, I always think like, how much language can somebody take in, you know? Oh, yeah. He He must have listened to so much stuff. And it's you know, encyclopedic. Yeah, it really is. And then, and then he plays it all so effortlessly and casually. Yeah. It always know? sounds like it's coming to his mind. It's not like he's pulling something out of his bag. You know, it always sounds no. like a genuine uh, idea. You know, yep. Yeah, totally. um, never like showing off his his skills or his knowledge. Or it's just right. if you know so much stuff, it'll come out for sure. Totally. Without you. Uh, you know, pushing pressure on it or pulling it out, it'll come out for sure. Totally. Like those guys who know a ton of tunes, they will uh, most most of the time they will quote some tunes, but by accident because it's you know right. it's in there. Right, 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 right. It's just in there. Totally. And then that's happening with with him too. You know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I love Sullivan. I mean, there's so many musicians out here right now who are doing such amazing chris davis blows my oh, mind yeah. every time i hear her play yeah. she's amazing um yep and that, and that's the beautiful thing as well it's like that's one of the things that has been really good to realize as, for me as well and I, i think it's just good to realize everybody's out here and they've all got their own approach and they've got their own perspective on it and it's like and i'm like yes 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 <laughs> yeah. all of them <laughs> yeah And that means that I can be me too. Yeah, for sure. Right? Like that I, I'm just like, I don't need to try to be anything that I'm not. Just like deepen the thing that's already there as much mm. as I can. Starting five years ago or so, that's I started really getting into bebop actually for the first time in my life. Yeah. Like really listening to a lot of Horace Silver and Bud Powell. I remember Maybe you, was a little more you told that. me about yeah. that when we hung out in Cologne. You told me about that you went to check out a lot of uh, Horace Silver, mainly because of his left hand also. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was definitely in that thing for a while. And now I'm like opening up. I mean, yeah, that's the amazing thing about this music. There's just so much to discover all the time. Mm -hmm. Like now I'm starting to get into Cecil Taylor solo. Mm. Uh, that's deep. Like, uh, oh, it's really deep, man. Um, Silent Tongues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the one I have to. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. And crystal clear. Um, and not, crystal nev clear. never a wasted note. Yep. And it's so interesting how sort of misinformed people are about what Cecil Taylor is about. Sure. Yeah. 
right? You know, mm-hmm. they're like, oh yeah, he's just free and play. Yeah. It's like there's a lot of very rigorous structure. Yeah. Going on here. Maybe and it he, just it doesn't line up with your Western idea of how music <laughs> is supposed to be organized. It is very interesting, sort of that misinformation. <laughs> yeah, you already went in that direction a little bit, but I want I want to know a little bit more about. You said uh, there was a point in your development where you really felt the need to go back and fill in the gaps that you that you saw in yourself. I'm interested in in what you went back for, but as, because I I feel the same way about me, like. Uh, When you're young, you're taking all everything in, and you're you have your your heroes that you always go, and then you find out what they were listening to, and in yeah. a way, the older I get, the the farther I go back to, you know, to to the core of this music, you know, sure. not speaking about classical music, that's another thing which right. sort of right, goes right, right. on a different level all the time, but in our music, you know. Too many people are just focusing on everything that's coming from, you know, 60s onward. Right. Or even when you talk to a lot of young students right now, maybe end of 90s until now, you know, uh, that can also yeah. happen. Like, uh, and and I feel I really feel the need to go go really go back. So I'm wondering what kind of stuff did you uh, did you seek out uh, in order to give you some more foundation well, or strengthen see, uh, strengthen the f- foundation i mean i i just did all sorts of stuff as far as you know as far as listening was going in particular i i i you know i started listening to a lot of like lester young yeah for phrasing roy eldridge for phrasing mm. listening to like duke ellington arrangements for ideas about harmony yeah Would you take stuff off the record then, also, or uh, if you ju- so, you're just even, listening? I was just listening. I was just like, re- like get in here, like just yeah. spending time immersed in those worlds. Yeah. Um, I don't think I was doing it in like a secluded monk kind of way, you know, or you know, if you know what I mean. It wasn't like I was walling myself off from the rest of the other stuff. I was still listening to a lot of modern music, and I was still. Uh, you know, I love music from all sorts of genres. And so, you know, I would be listening to say some deer hoof and then I would listen to a bunch of Duke Ellington. Yeah. You know, and it didn't, it doesn't feel strange for me to do that. Yeah. Um, I think that like 2008 or so I went through a period for where for a number of years, I was not listening to very much instrumental music at all. Mm-hmm. I was mostly listening to bands. That was the stuff that was inspiring me. I was really drawn to lyrics and songs that seemed to have these obscure, hidden, powerful meanings. Um, and the ideas of production and song construction and things like that. Well, now I'm listening to it all again. But now I'm like, I went through then a period where I had to go sort of far in the other direction for a minute, I guess. Yeah. And then came to that point where I'm talking about where I would like, okay, I can listen to this band and I can listen to Duke. Sure, yeah. And, you know, I can listen to this and it, and it can all live together and mix together naturally. Yeah, mingle. You know? Yeah, totally. And that and that's one of the funny things. It's like now when I'm sitting down to compose or I'm sitting down to to improvise, it very easily could be some combination of Duke's harmony And Kurt's harmony, you know, like those things blend together. The rhythmic structure could be a slow swing tune, and it all, and it could also be like an electronic beat. Mm-hmm. It's like all of those things are just sort of percolating around there together, and so it's not like I have one preconceived idea of like, well, this is how my songs are going to go. It's like it's all available. Yeah. Can you maybe go a little bit into? What do you, if you have a daily practice, what do you do each time at the piano or what are you doing more now these days? We already touched one on that th- a little bit in the, in the yeah. beginning. But Well, one of the things that I like to do, I mean, is basically playing a drone, singing something against the drone and playing it again. Yeah. Playing it I back. I do that too. <laughs> like yep. pitches, you mean, or, you know. Yep. Yeah. And connecting, yeah, connecting phrases 
just creating a feeling of closeness with melodic material. Yeah. Um, I, I like that as just sort of like a meditation to get myself <laughs> available. It's so to, funny. Yeah. Uh, to do some, yeah, make myself available to do whatever else I might want to do practicing wise. Mm. But if I start with that and with a few other types of things that help get my body feeling involved as well, mm. um, then I feel like I have uh, a decent foundation that I can then work on anything from. For better or worse, I tend to write the entire composition before I wrote it, write anything down. Uh, can you like, explain that I, more? I compose the whole thing in my head before I put anything on paper. Okay, yeah. For so most we, of my tunes, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, almost all the time that's how I write. But don't you forget like, sometimes, forget sections then, or...? Of course, and, and then I forget sections. And it's not a great idea. Uh, there's yeah. totally really good things I come up with that I sometimes forget. But then I usually find other things uh, along the also, way. Yeah, that, that along the way, it tends to happen that the things that I forget are the things that are forgettable. I know what you mean, but I have made the experience uh, with with writing down. Uh, music I have to write down every thought that I have because mm. I might forget more what doesn't feel comfortable from for myself you know and uh, right. Um, right, right but right, right, that right. would but for me that uh, will usually be the more interesting thought you know because what I bec because what I will remember is mostly what feels you know natural and and comfortable for me but that will be something that I <laughs> That for me is sometimes forgettable, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of value in doing something that then puts takes you out of your zone of the thing. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Like writing things down right away and just not even like second guessing it or allowing you to massage it into a more typical shape. Yeah, yeah, right. Just you know have it on paper and then you can deal with it later in a way. Right? I just Right. Because I've I have the feeling that everything that that will come to my mind, either comfortable or uncomfortable, is connected through me mm -hmm. having that feeling in that particular time. So that's part of yeah, the right. tune, and I might take it out, but it is part. It's kind of part of the tune already. So I just write right. it down, and it might be transposed to another key or put in reverse. But for me, it has the value already. Like it came to my mind. There's there's a connection to be found there, and I might not end right. up end up uh, using it, but still I I want to have it there, you know, and then well, maybe that's a, that's a that's a it's a solid argument for it. In the meantime, I still continue to just poke away at my little songs every time I get to the piano and like, yeah. but probably there's a couple of those little pieces that came along along the way that might have been the connecting tissue that helped you get from one section to another, right? Yeah. You know, sometimes that's what those things are really for. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, I had an old uh, bootleg of yours. I think it was with Jochen Rückert and Lagerlund. Don't remember who, might have been Matt Penman or, I'm not Matt sure. Matt Brewer, maybe. Matt Brewer. Uh, in very. Italy? No, no, I think it was in New York and it was, was very, very early. Okay. And I think you played a song that ended up on the new trio record with uh, with Billy Hart and Ben Street. Do you remember which song? I'm just trying to put... Because I don't have that bootleg it, anymore. It could be Unravel. I think so. It could, be the third, it could be the third track on that record, which itself has a pretty crazy story um, on the trio record. Because mm -hmm. we recorded most everything that was going to be on that record. And it felt like we just needed a little bit more music. We had tried a couple of tunes that I had just written that didn't really feel like they were quite getting off the ground because I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted from them at all yet. I didn't have a sense of the form. I just had like a melody and then no idea of what to do for yeah. soloing. You know, we tried it and Manfred's like, oh, I like this, but it doesn't seem like it's fully formed yet. And I'm like, yeah. okay, well, cool. So I played that song Unravel with Ben a while ago and he just remembered it. And he was like, what about that tune, Unravel? And we hadn't played it all tour. That song happens to be in 13.8. We, we just 
decided that we were going to press record yeah and not tell billy anything not tell him that the tune was in 138 not tell it that it, tell him that it was aaba with seven bar a sections and an oh you didn't B. give him any music also no no sheet no okay no sheet we just pressed record and started playing and we just captured his initial reactions to what he was hearing great Now I want to you know, go back to, <laughs> to listen to it again. And that, like, so we sort of start with it being sort of clearly in the 13, kind of, with me and Ben. But Billy is just looking at the landscape that he finds himself in and commenting on it. Yeah. And, you know, we gradually find something more elastic, which isn't exactly 13, or it's not metronomically at all. Yeah. But um, it also still has that feeling of the flow to it. And I really just love the way that Billy plays on that it, and, and Ben as well, because there's such deep listening happening in that moment. Mm -hmm. 